Amen. Isaiah 38. Remain standing as I read the passage. Kind of a different place to go on this family, matter of family, but if you see the verse that I put in the graphic, I want to start here because my concern arises from just a simple phrase that I'm going to use in a different context as God used in I, with Isaiah through Hezekiah. But I want you to get the thought because we're living in a world of confusion and on every angle when it comes to marriage, the home, family, relationships. It's, this world's full of confusion. And 1 Corinthians, I think it's 14.33 says, God is not the author of confusion. So if it's not God, take your pick. <laughs> Who is it? It's not God. Amen? So we got we to gotta ask God for some direction. Amen? Hey, uh, verse uh, chapter 38 of Isaiah. The Bible says, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos, came unto him and said, Thus saith the Lord. Now here's the Lord using the prophet Isaiah to say something. And I wonder if you could put yourself in his shoes if God would use the same manner that he did with Hezekiah, the prophet of God. Watch. Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. What would you do if God said that to you? Wow. Would there be some changes that are arise in your mind and your heart? You say, I need to take care of some business here. That's what he told them. The Bible says, then Hezekiah turned his face toward the wall and prayed unto the Lord. I think that's a good reaction, would you not? Hey, God, what's going on? Hey, God, it's been great. You know, he's had his challenges, but this is great, amen? One of the greatest revivals took place, read chapters before in, 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 in 2 Kings there, amen? He prayed unto the Lord and said, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech thee, how I have walked before thee in truth and with a perfect heart, and have done that which is good in thy sight. Hezekiah wept sore. Then came the word of the Lord to Isaiah, saying, Go and say to Hezekiah, Thus saith the Lord, Amen, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears, Amen. They're genuine tears. They're not fabricated like you see in Hollywood. Amen, they're real. Behold, I will add unto thee 15 years. I'm going to give you 15 more years to live. And I will deliver, verse 6, thee, and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. They had so many problems with them. The Syrians, they're still in the news today. I will defend the city. This shall be a sign unto thee from the Lord that the Lord shall do this thing that he hath spoken. Behold, I will bring again the shadow of the degrees, which has gone down in the sundial of Ahaz, 10 degrees backward, so the sun returned 10 degrees, by which degrees it was gone down. Let's skip down here and go down. Let's see here. Down to verse 21. For Isaiah had said, Say, what was his health problem? What was his sickness? Let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he shall recover. Hezekiah also said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? You know, God approves of medical treatment. Some people got this wild idea that, no, God's not for medical treatment. He is. Now, some medical science has had to learn a lot of things, and they're still learning, because <laughs> we have an amazing body designed by God. Amen? But God can use medicine. We read examples like this in the Bible. Amen? So, but let's pray, and we'll get in, and we'll use a phrase. We'll talk a little bit about this, about Hezekiah. Father, again, help us today. Uh, give us understanding. Lord God, help us when it comes to matters of the home and family, even as we celebrate down, Lord God, in a short time, 
Mother's Day, Father's Day next month. Lord, we know that these principles ought to be applied no matter what time of year. It's not on a holiday that we need to focus on this. But God, my heart's heavy, my heart's burdened for homes and families, individuals here, Lord God. Now God, give us understanding. God, help us to examine our own hearts. Not look outside of our own lives, but focus on what the Holy Spirit of God is speaking to us about in regards to our own lives and what we need to do. We need your help. We need your strength. God, we want your will and way to be accomplished. Now bless, fill me and use me. Lord God, as I deliver the truth from your word, and we'll give you all the praise and glory for what you'll accomplish in and through each and every one. For I ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Just a little side note before I get into the family matters here. Um, you know, God gave them 15 years. Unfortunately, because of pride in chapter 39, he got messed up. The Bible says he showed Amen. The Babylonians, all the treasure of the house of the Lord. You know, I, I, can I say this? If I prayed and God direct dealt with me in a manner of this, and I hope you would feel the same, that we would not waste those 15 years. Amen. That we would use them wisely. The Bible tells us in the New Testament to redeem the time for the days are evil. That was written 2,000 years ago. It still applies in 2022. I would pray and hope we don't waste whatever time God gives us. You ever pray and you feel, but maybe God did heal you from whatever it is. Maybe you sought medical and they couldn't figure out what was going on. Amen. I, there's, there's things like that that happen. And then, like I said, doctors. My sister-in-law ended up she having a hip replacement the other day. It's amazing how quick they get you up and running, or not running, walking, I should say. Amen. And uh, praise the Lord, she's doing good. You know, we're getting in those ages, I guess. <laughs> That's just life, amen. Everything's working good now for me, so far, I mean, at least for the most part. And, um, but at the same time, you know what? You never know when that time may come. You, you get that news. Amen. Listen, I, every time you get blood work, I don't know about you, I'm not worrying. I'm thinking, I wonder if the doctor's going to call me. Serious. When you get tests done, you're kind of on pins and needles a little bit. What is going on? And you wonder if some results are going to come back that you might, might change your life. Amen? The doctor may give you that news and say, you know, you, our estimates, and again, it's just an estimate. It's supposed to be a scientific guess. You got so long to live. Some out outlive. I've seen people live years past the three month cycle. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> you know. So, anyway, but let's not waste. Amen. So, the purpose for the statement is He says, set your house in order. You got every, all your affairs in order. You're going to die. <laughs> God told me to tell you, Hezekiah, you're going to die. Amen. But I want to take that phrase and use it in a different way. I want to use it in the way of the home and the family and your marriage. And I want you to understand some. I'm trying to be understanding with everybody's situation. I may not know everybody's personal situation, but I am aware of some. And I'm not trying to be difficult with anyone here. It is a challenge in the home, in the family, in the marriages. There's so many things that are happening now. That when I was growing up, and if you're in my age bracket, or maybe even a little younger, you did not have to deal. We've always had sin around, but there was seemed to be a little less opportunity for it in some ways. But it's been around. Read your Bible. Look at the sin described in the Bible. Amen? It's not new. But I'm concerned. And I believe with all my heart, we need to have God's order in our home. It's God's order. Amen? It's not mine. It's God's order. I'm not here to tell you what I think and how I feel. 
I'm here to tell you what God said. That's what I want to deliver to you. Now, some of something in part of this message may, may or not be too palatable. <laughs> but can I say this? The Bible tells us in Paul's letters, it works effectually in those that believe. How, however, the degree of effectiveness of this book depends on whether you believe it or not. You say, I don't know about that. I got my thoughts on that. Well, whatever. You know, by the way, if you have a question about something, not that I, I know it all, I don't. I've had questions asked me. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. That's just life. This, is book, this book is bigger than Ken Parrott. It's bigger than you. It's bigger than all of us put together. It's bigger than Google. Hey, Google. Hey, Siri. Hey, Alexa. You think, oh, the wealth and the knowledge of the Internet, God's well beyond that. He's the source of all wisdom. Amen? And so we need to look to God. I want to see order in my life, order in my marriage. My kids are grown up. We're at that stage, if you're a grandparent, that we're trying to assist our children. I'm not trying to take charge of their homes. And this is an important fact. One of the three major causes of divorce is where you, Grandparents interfere in the lives of their kids that are married. That's one of the major causes of, of divorce. Interference. I don't want to be that cause of that divorce. Now, if they come to me and say, hey, Dad, I have some questions about something. What do you think I should do? Amen. And if you're married, number one, y'all... <laughs> As much as possible, and I know this is part of the challenge amongst us, you got to work with your spouse. Amen? We're not talking about compromise. We're just saying you got to work with your spouse. And it's possible that one or the other may not be on the same page spiritually. And that's an increased challenge in the marriage to make things work. All I can say is, I know as a husband, God's commanded me to love my wife as Christ loved the church. And that's a, that's a lifelong situation to work on as a man. And the Bible says for the ladies to obey and honor their husbands. I know that word obey is not very popular today. I said that word, or my wife said that word in our vows when we got married. Well, they took that word out in ours. We can't handle that one. See, we, got, we come a long way. We come a long way. And it didn't happen overnight. It happens over little by little, weeks and months, decades. And next thing you know it, here's where God wants us, and here's where the society has gone off course, or even Christianity. Because the standard, we're living in a postmodern world. What does that mean? It means this. There are some believers out there, they're, they're struggling with this. They just have a hard time swallowing what the Bible says and believing that it's an absolute authority of absolute truth. That's part of the problem. Postmodernism teaches there's no absolutes when it comes to morality. They may accept that in measurement, in sciences, but they don't accept that in morality. But God defines morality, not the government. <laughs> you say, well, the government says I can do this. If you're a Christian, you better say, I better study that in the Bible. And if it's pretty clear cut, don't look for an excuse not to obey God. It is challenging. Amen. It is challenging. So I'm going to do my best as I can, to help you through this process. But I wanted to use that as a springboard text, so to speak, to get into this series. You need to set your house in order, not for death, but for the sake of order in your home. Are you going to do that? If there's something that you need to do, you need to act upon it. Don't put it off. It's not, to, listen, yes, husbands and wives, talk about it, amen? Amen. And deal with it, but let's act upon it. 
We can talk to our heads who are blue in the face. Are you going to do something about it? What are we going to do about this? You know there's a, there's a problem. We need to deal with it. Amen? We need to, and we need to stay close together. Amen. And I just, I just, my heart is so touched that God has allowed us, not that everything's all over with, with this pandemic situation, but to stay together for the most part. Yes, there's some casualties, in a sense, spiritual casualties, unfortunately. But thank you. Thank you for reconnecting. Thank you for coming back. The doors are open. How long is this window of opportunity going to be? I don't know. I don't take it for granted. Could shut at any moment. Then we're back to dealing with those challenges. First Corinthians chapter 11. I need to go here. So I didn't make this stuff up. God said it. And God put order in the home. God did this. I didn't do this. So I, I kind of liken this to a how can I say, life like a play, so to speak, in the sense that there's a, there's a script that goes in that play. But in this script, we're not going to deviate from it. That's why the word is scriptures. These are the writings of God, script. This is not my writings. God set the order I did not set the order. I didn't make this order up. God did. Amen? So when we look at this, we need to keep that in mind. So the Bible says here, verse 1, be followers of me, of 1 Corinthians 11, even as I also am of Christ. And that teaches a little principle to understand. Oh, I've never followed one man. Well, I guess we got to rip that verse out of the Bible. Paul says, as long as I'm following Christ, follow me. I could show you many places in the Bible where Paul says, follow me. <laughs> Why? Not that he's perfect, but he's following Christ. You better follow people who are following Christ. Now, when they fall, you better get your eyes back on Jesus and say, okay, they fell. And let's not give up on God and the Bible and church in the process because someone disappointed you. I've seen a lot of that in all the years I've been ministering and pastoring. People get their eyes off God and someone disappointed them. I didn't say it was good. You know, I wouldn't say it's easy. But we got to refocus our attention back on the Lord. Okay, someone messed up. You say, something. the pastor messed up in my church. There was terrible sin happened. Okay, you don't stop going to church. You get Maybe you got to leave that church and go to another church, and hopefully you line up with a church that's preaching and teaching you the Word of God. For your sake, because you need that. You need that fellowship. For the life of me. See, this is my life, okay? But you only see me when you come. This is my life, okay? I'm a pastor and I'm a shepherd. I care for the flock. And you know what? You say, I, I'm giving you opportunity the facts are this. I'm giving you opportunity for four times a week to get some truth. I'm not trying to penalize anybody by going off YouTube for all the other services but this, but I'm just trying to tell you we need to come together. Amen? And I'll, I'll keep the Sunday morning going. But we need, we need each other. We need to encourage each other. Amen. That's, it's not about making me feel good because you got people here. That's not it. But we need to see each other, and we need to help each other out. So anyway, verse 2, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things and keep the ordinances which I delivered unto you. We'll have the Lord's table tonight. Going to keep the ordinance. What's the other one? Baptism. That's it. Well, what about foot washing? That's not an ordinance. Jesus used that as an example to humble yourself. He's walking. Can you imagine? He's washing the disciples' feet. I, some churches have this as an ordinance, but it's not labeled as an ordinance. He didn't command it as an ordinance. Baptism and Lord's table are the only two. But we should humble ourselves. Amen? Speaking about, listen, my wife, she's got aching feet. I'll rub them for her. 
I'll do that for her. I don't know. I wouldn't do that. It's your wife. What's wrong with you? You know what? If you had your husband and your wife in really rough shape health-wise, I think you'd be lowering yourselves down a little bit. Get off your high horse and start caring and loving and showing some compassion for them. My wife did that for her mother, dying of cancer, bowel cancer. Little my daughter, Melissa, she, she changed the, the colostomy. It's what she did as a little girl. She saw her nanny die. You lower yourself. I would never do that so dirty. You got some things to learn, some compassion, some care, and some love for someone that you if you truly love somebody, there's no limit. There's no limit for your care and love for your parents, your spouse, your kids. My wife watches these things on, I don't know what it is, Facebook or she sees this guy, and this guy, from what I understand, is not saved, but he's showing all these children that are severely handicapped. And these parents didn't want to abort them, and they kept them, and they're facing these huge challenges, and he does video clips of them. Talk about compassion. Amen? This assisted suicide stuff. They're dealing with taking, they're aborting at the beginning of life, and they're eliminating them at the end of life. That's our world for us. It's a mess. Now here's the verse. Here, are you ready? Verse 3. But I would have you to know the head of every man is Christ. Hey guys, you got someone in charge of you. The order is Christ. You're under him. He's your head. He's your authority. Are you in tune with the authority? Well, I'm not really where I should be spiritually. Well, get on board. Get right with God if you're saved. Now, if you're not saved, you got an excuse. It is, listen, we, as believers, we have no excuse. If you're saved, you know Christ. You have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know what? Some of you here have no clue, maybe, what it's like to be married to an unsaved spouse. You have no clue whatsoever. I don't. I read the scriptures about it in 1 Peter 3. And the Bible says, if you tried to win them with the word, the only way you might be able to win them is by the conversation. In context, it's about a man who's not obeying the word of God. And his wife's already tried, or the, husband, or the wife's already tried to talk to him about the word. He won't listen to the word. So God says, zip it up and show your love by just loving them and treating them right, by your conversation, by your behavior, by your conduct. You can flip that around where you have an unsaved wife and a saved husband. Just smother them in love. <laughs> just love them to death. Literally, that's what Christ did. So does love for us, amen? So if you, listen, you're, you're married today, you got a, a spouse, you're both saved. Okay, next challenges are, you know, some are on different levels spiritually. Okay, well, you need to grow. Are you growing? Are you feeding the flesh all week long? Is this the only time you get some spiritual food? Is this it? Is this the only place you get spiritual food? Well, I'm glad you're here. Come back. But do you know the Bible says... Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. When Satan tempted him to change those stones into bread, he, he quoted Deuteronomy. You say, I eat, boy, I can't wait. You know, it, it's, it's going on quarter to 22 uh, noon here, and my stomach's going to start growling soon, and, you know, we're going to eat, and amen. Good to eat, amen. But you know what? He says, you think bread's enough. You think having your breakfast or lunch and supper and snacks in between is enough. He says, what about me? What about me, the Word of God? You ever study that thing about manna in the Old Testament? When every day God rained manna down from heaven, they did one of two things. They did what God said, collected it, as much as they would eat. No waste. Or they'd walk all over it. 
I liken the man unto the word of God. Did you get up this morning without spending a little? Well, we're going to church. I'm going to get my spiritual food at church. Well, again, I'm glad you're here. Praise God. But you're starving spiritually. You need to feed yourself. They did a study over with um, concerning Bill Hybels and Rick Warren. They did these, these guys went in there and marketing and all that. They said one of the key things they said they found out with churches is this, they're not, the average person in the pew is not a self-feeder. That was done in Christianity today, years ago. The average believer that comes to church does not feed themselves. You say, why are we laboring on this? We're going to talk about marriage and home, and, because this is part of the problem. This is part of the problem we're facing. Amen. Listen, we all have our faults and failures. I have my faults and failures. I have strengths and weaknesses. We all do. Amen. We all do. Let's admit it. We do. I need to grow in some areas. Amen. But we need to be growing in the Lord. We need to be growing in the Lord. And if you're not, there's something wrong. What's going on? Amen. Amen. We've got some questions. We need to, we need to talk about some things. <laughs> so he says this, the head of every man is Christ. You got that, guys? The Bible teaches in the book of Ephesians that in the home, the husband is a picture of Christ. And in the home, the wife is a picture of the bride. We talked a little bit about this in the Ten Virgins over in the Wednesday night series. I mentioned the difference between the virgins and the bride. So the wife is supposed to show the picture. The bride represents the church, believers who know, people who are saved, and how we are supposed to be in submission and willingly yield ourselves to the bridegroom, Jesus Christ. And God takes that same illustration and says, that's the way it should be in marriage. It's voluntary Love and voluntary submission. It's what it's supposed to be. Vol and the, you say, you mean to say, when we read that Ephesians 5, you know, the Lord really hits the husband's heart with that love issue and hits the woman's with the submission part and respect part. Does that mean that's the only thing I got a concern? No, it's just that I think he picked on the Lord through the Holy Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul, picked out some key areas that are a challenge in most marriages. And what it is, is the more a woman respects and submits to her husband, you're, number one, we need to do that unconditionally. And that's not a statement for sexual abuse, physical abuse, or verbal abuse. I'm just telling you. Not one Christian man in this world has a right. That's a sin against God and your spouse. But the reality is, it does happen sometimes. So, if I love my wife as Christ loved the church, and is she, is there, if her heart, is, if, is it tender to the things of God, that will stimulate more respect. But I still need to love her even though she might not respect me. And the problem is some people have a challenge with that. They, well, I don't know about that, you know. That's the world we live in. That's the world we live in. Well, I'm not going to do that because they're not doing their part. Good luck. You're never going to get anything solved. You're in a vicious cycle. And the more a woman respects and submits to her husband, that ought to stimulate, if the husband's got any sense of spirituality in him, it ought to stir up some of that, more of that love. Man, my wife loves me. She respects me. She's willing, voluntarily submitting to me. Voluntary submission. That's, that's Ephesians 5. Maybe you need to read that one. Husband and wife together sit down. At, you know, when the kids are in bed, amen? You're probably saying, man, I'm whipped up from all that, working all day, and the kids, and oh, I can't stay awake. But you can spend hours on a cell phone, tablet, and watching shows. And you got no time for that. If you, if you see that homes and families and marriages are out of order, you're going to do something about this. You're not just going to ignore and brush it off. Oh, there goes a pastor on the family and 
home kick for another month or two. I got a whole series of messages from last year on foundations of the family. I'm trying to give you some look at this from different directions. You might find, well, I've heard some of this before. Amen. It could be repeated again. It doesn't hurt. Are you doing it? That's the next question. Are you doing, are you following God's order and his instructions? Not mine. I, I'm just a messenger. Don't shoot the messenger, okay? I'm just a messenger. That's all I am. I, listen, you want to have a, 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 a strong church? You need strong homes, strong marriages. The churches are as strong as the marriages and homes within it. Amen. Where are we? I don't know. Where do you think you are? Don't have to answer that out loud. Amen. So look at this. Again, we're on that verse 3. The head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. I didn't put it in the script. God says there's the order. And that's not for you guys to get on a power trap either. Oh, I'm married now. Look at that ring here. Oh, yeah. I got a servant and a slave now for me. Really? Where'd you get that from? That's not what Christ taught. That's not what the Bible teaches. You know, if you treat a woman in accord with the Scriptures, she's, she's treated with the highest degree of respect in any culture, in any religion. There's some religions that are pretty rough on the women. Amen. But if you treat, God help us if you're mistreating each other. Number one, in front of your kids. And number two, in front of the world. In front of the church. Amen. That's not right. See, I wonder why my kids didn't want, you know, to get married, maybe, let's say. Maybe they didn't see the, the, the proper, beautiful picture between Christ and the church el illustrated in the husband and the wife. getting pretty tough these days because and can I say this there's some unsaved couples that show that beautiful picture and they don't even know God because they show love and respect to each other shame on us if we're not showing that beautiful picture amen and then he says this and this is the real kicker here are you ready and the head of Christ is God <laughs> come on do we not believe in the deity of Christ? Yes, we do. Amen? Three persons, one God. What did Christ do? Are you ready? Philippians chapter 2. That's what he did. Are you ready? It's something... I'm glad God put that in there because it shows us, well, he doesn't deserve it comes up a wife to a husband or vice versa the wife to the you know the husband to the wife he doesn't she doesn't deserve do you amen I, I you already heard what i said we ought to respect each other unconditionally that's what the bible teaches amen so Where I lost my place here. Where did I tell you to turn here? Thank you. I, I, my Bible's open to Ephesians. Why is it open there? Verse 5. Are you ready? You know this verse. But it needs to be said because you've got to understand what God was trying to get across here. There's a key principle in this order that God teaches. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Now listen, that is a powerful statement for the deity of Christ. Amen. But made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a what? Servant. servant. A servant. Isn't that what we just referred to? You know, I said, you know, the statement about the foot washings, Amen. 
you know, it's, it's a good example, but it's not an ordinance. It wouldn't hurt for some of us men to do that for our wives. Teach them humility. I will never do that. You don't know my wife's feet. Needs need to show some humility. Just thank God she's breathing, she's alive, she's able to walk. You can go out on dates together and enjoy each other in the Lord if you're saved, amen? Can you do that? He says what? He took upon him the form of servant. He was made in the likeness of man. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The Bible teaches in each of those relationships in 1 Corinthians 11, there's voluntary submission. Christ voluntarily submitted to God the Father and said, I'm willing to die. I'm willing. God became man. Christ lived a perfect, sinless life for 33 and a half years. We sang, I gave my life for thee. He left heaven's glory to come to this dark world. Why? To save your soul. That's why he came. Oh, what a savior. Amen. He did it voluntarily. He faced, the Bible says, he faced all the challenges you and I face in this body, living in a body of flesh. The aches, the pains, the hurts, the sorrows, he wept, amen? He faced it all. He's able, the Bible says, when you're going through something, he's able to secure them that are tempted, amen? He's able to help you through your problems. He's been there. Amen. There's not one. Listen, but the thing, the big difference between him and us is this, yet without sin. Praise God for that because he couldn't save your soul if that was the case. Aren't you glad for that? You know, when he was in that garden, he was saying, Lord, I want your will to be done. He said, not my will, but thine be done. Luke's account says there were sweat drops of blood. Good old Dr. Luke, he get that little bit of blood in there. Amen. Good old Doc. It's so unique, each gospel. But they go together. Amen. God just used these guys. Amen. You know what? He yielded. He says, I don't want my will. I want thine be done. Did he resist the rest? Peter didn't want it to happen. <laughs> Chopped that ear off the high priest servant. You know, when Jesus was in that garden, he says, where's Christ? Where's Christ? And Jesus, the Bible says this. He said these three words, I am he. Do you know what happened? They all fell backwards. Whew. I am he. <laughs> That's God in the flesh speaking. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't comprehend. I read that and I say, there's no movie that can come close to anything in this book. <laughs> I'm not knocking any of these other Christian things. I know they're trying to get the message across, amen? But he said, I am he. And <laughs> they had a whole bunch of soldiers there to arrest him. They didn't need anybody. Oh, yeah. As a lamb to the slaughter. That's what he did. He submitted himself willingly. How about you? Ladies? Now, I get, I get, I get some of this. I, I preached elsewhere some years ago, and I got man. I tell you, some of the guys were not too happy. I had a happy camper with Pastor Parrot, but I do hit on the men a little harder because they're in the under Christ. I'm not excusing any woman from a lack of respect and submission. I'm not endorsing any of that. But so why are you pick on the man so much? Yeah. I don't think we can cover all that. I got I have a I'll get to the note sooner or later here. But the problem is the Bible says in Adam all die. The Bible says because of 
the disobedience of one man. You ever read the Genesis 3 when they sinned in the garden there? The Bible says, and her husband was with her. Well, just passive. Some men are very passive. You better step up to the plate and protect your wife. Oh, I'm feeding. I, oh, I bring the bacon home. You know, I went to work and give them the paycheck. We pay the bills. That's all. That's all I need to do. You're not right with God. There's more. Your wife needs emotional help, spiritual help and leadership. You better be a provider. If you're not, 1 Timothy 5, 8 says you're worse than an unbeliever. God help us for that. But the bottom line is, God says he was right there. Passive, not active. But God pinned it on him. Paul's letter to Timothy says, she was deceived. That leads us into a whole conversation, but we won't get in that one tonight, this morning. <clears throat> so what happened? Because Christ humbled himself, became, he took upon him the form of a servant, became obedient to death, Christ is exalted. Wherefore, verse 9 of Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him, given him a name above, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in the earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue, wow, every knee and every tongue. How about that? No matter, I don't believe that. I don't believe that stuff. I hate God, they say some people. Your knee will bow. I love that song by Ron Ham. Bow the knee, bow the knee. <laughs> I'll be willing to bow the knee to my Savior. Not a problem. And we'll all be prostrate in front of him. Amen. Laying flat on our faces before God after we cast those crowns. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I couldn't have done it without you. You're so good to me. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You're so good to me. You've been good to me. Hey Amen. If you're honest with yourself, he's been good to you too. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Oh, I can't wait for that day. There's no unbelievers. Amen. There's no unbelievers. Listen, you're going to confess. You're going to confess someday. Unbeliever today. So I don't believe that. I don't believe that. You will be confessing. Back to 1 Corinthians 11. Order, order. Verse 2 says he had the ordinances. You see the word, it's got some or order in the ordinances. There's orders, there's orders. So, it's got to get things straight here. Guys, your wife is not inferior to you. Why? Are not Christ and God equal? It's not an inferiority. Some people got this weird idea about Christianity in the Bible. They say, the Bible says women are more inferior. They're just missed. They're just deceived. That, that is obvious. If the head of Christ is God and they're the same, Christ is not inferior, but he's voluntarily submitting to God the Father as a wife should ought to voluntarily submit herself to her husband, as a husband should obviously voluntarily submit himself to God. The head of every man is Christ. So my question to you guys is, are you submitting to God? Well, you don't know my, are you submitting yourself to God? Well, stop it. No excuses. Are you submitting yourself to God? That's where God says for you and I to be as husbands. Ladies, are you submitting yourselves to your husband? By the way, that's submission to God because that's God's order. Those are God's commands. And by the way, we'll get into this down the road. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Well, you don't know my parents, pastor. I don't have to know them. You better show obedience and honor. 
may I say this, obedience is action, honor is, is attitude. Remember that. How about that in the husband-wife relation? Action and attitude. Obedience is action. Honor, respect, is attitude. Should we not have a good attitude towards each other? Should not the children have a right attitude towards their parents? In addition to obeying them? And if you can't, you've disobeyed God's commands. The children have disobeyed. Husbands and wives have disobeyed. God's got an order. So I'm not suggesting changing God's order. And if we keep God's order as he tells us to keep his order, amen, then reality is this. You say, well, it hasn't worked. You've got to understand something. God tells us how things should be. And if they don't work, it doesn't fall on him. It falls on us. We're missing something somewhere. We're missing the boat on something in our marriage, in our homes, in our family. Well, I've tried that, Pastor. Really? Come on, are you honest? Well, you know, things are not all that good. You know, it's just... Someone's missing the boat somewhere. Husband, wife, parents, kids. Someone's missing something. We know God and Christ are fine. Amen? They're, they're doing wonderful. But what about everybody in between? It works. We just got to make it work. We need to obey God. Trust and obey. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand. We'll close. We'll stop there. We'll pick it up. We'll look some more at 1 Timothy 2 and look at some matters in there. Father, help us today. We need your help and strength. Lord God, you, you set the order up. The order of the home and the family. Help us. Help us, Lord God, to readjust our homes, our marriages, in accord with your scriptures. You wrote the script. We have no right to change what you, what you told us to do. Help us to obey it. Oh God, give us your strength. Help us. God, put a hedge of protection about every marriage and home represented here. Individuals, Lord God, not married, yet to be married, Lord God. Lord God, please, Lord, help them. Help them. Help them, Lord God. Give us your strength. Help us, Lord God, to be patient and understanding with the people that we have in our homes under our own roof. God, we need that. God, help us to this morning, Lord. Father, as we prepare to go home here from this place, God, please, Lord God, just help us to meditate and think upon these matters. Lord, if there's some changes that need to be done, help us not to put them off. Help us not go another day. Help us not put our head on our pillows tonight, Lord God, without acting upon something. God, we need you. Give us safety, Lord God. Bless our afternoon. Bring us back together again as we remember, Lord God, you and the Lord's table. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you all.